Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for April 1st, 2022. Since it's Friday, I usually take your questions, but I, I made an editorial decision today that there are so many important, significant developments occurring uh, in at virtually every 24-hour period that I'm going to review these strategic developments uh, as a priority. And so I apologize to those of you who sent me questions. There were some very good questions, and if I have the time, I'll write a response to you personally. Uh, and I do appreciate the, the interaction and the questions, but I think the overwhelming importance of being updated on what's happening strategically, especially since the, the Western media is censoring this or lying about these developments, that it's my responsibility to bring them to you. So let's start with some on the economy. The deadline given to the U.S. and the European nations to start paying for gas and oil to Russia in rubles is today. This is not an April Fool's joke. Putin made a very shrewd decision that rather than allow the economic warfare to degrade the value of the Russian currency, he would insist that the oil and gas be paid for in rubles. Now, the Russians are apparently not going to cut off deliveries immediately, but so far, most Western countries have said they won't do it. They argue it's too hard to do. Well, it's not too hard to do. You just go to a Russian bank and buy rubles. Uh, but this is part of the continuing economic warfare. So the Russian policy is no rubles, no gas. Now, who's hurt by this? Consumers in the transatlantic world. Take the case of Germany, for example. There are discussions now of rationing gasoline for uh, private transport. There are discussions of blackouts, uh, especially next fall and winter. But there's also discussion of cutting electricity to large consumers like industrial plants. What does this mean to the German economy? There are many economists who say that Germany faces a deep recession if there are cutoffs in, in oil and gas. There's no way that solar and wind and so-called sustainable uh, energy sources can replace the 20 to 40 percent of the electricity and uh, fuel uses in Germany that come that are supplied by Russia. Uh, don't forget that there was a German official who said, well, Germans should be willing to freeze for freedom. I'm not sure that's the case. Now, in the U.S., we see something even uh, that, that's quite silly. Biden is going to deal with this problem of rising gas prices by releasing a million barrels per day of oil from the strategic reserve. Now, this may have some marginal impact, but the question is, why are the prices going up? The oil has not yet been cut. Why don't you do something to address the role of speculators in driving up oil and gas prices along with everything else? Because we're seeing food prices skyrocket. This has nothing to do with supply and demand, at least not yet. What it has to do with is the free flow of money, of liquidity, into the hands of speculators through the Federal Reserve and the private banking system so they can bet on the prices and drive them up. So again, this is the people of the Western world are suffering because of the decisions made by the uh, NATO and U.S. leadership to minimally punish Russia but more importantly, to create circumstances for the removal of Putin, a regime, regime change in Russia. So next time you go to the gas pump, don't blame Putin. It's our own governments that through their idiotic green technology policies, the green uh, cutoff of funds to fossil fuel exploration and uh, shutting down coal and nuclear plants, and then conducting this economic warfare against Russia, it's the Western governments that are causing this, not Vladimir Putin. Now, meanwhile, the ruble has strengthened. Putin's strategy is working. Uh, the, and it's now at pre-war levels. This is 
uh, prompting talk of the possibility that the ruble will play a role, along with the convertible yuan from China, in moving to a new financial system, a talk of a gold-backed ruble. Well, that's not yet policy, but it certainly signals a, a, a trend in that direction. For example, the Indian decision to work with Russia on a, a ruble-rupee exchange rate. We also see Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, is in Delhi now for talks. Uh, now, the ruble would be backed not only by gold, but by oil, timber, strategic metals, wheat, and so on. Because Russia is, has invested significantly in scientific advance and in physical economy. Uh, one analyst wrote that, that what you see with Russia is that rather than digital printing press of a quantitative easing program of the many central banks, there's a move in a new direction, away from a flood of valueless money to a world of physical economy. So this is a trend. It's not necessarily a done deal, but we're seeing more and more talk as the dollar collapses, as the physical economy of the West collapses, we're seeing more and more talk in this direction. At the same time, there was a, a very sharp warning of a scarcity of goods that should be expected in the United States uh, due to inflation, supply chain problems, and so on. And this was uh, delivered in a speech in Texas by Robert Capito, a co-founder of BlackRock. He called it scarcity inflation, not temporal inflation, but scarcity inflation. Meanwhile, there were estimates that Two-thirds of Americans are now living paycheck to paycheck, 64%. And NBC did a poll and asked people who they blame for the inflation. Uh, asked Americans, 38% said they blame Biden. Well, the inflation started before Biden, but 38% said Biden. 28% blame COVID and the lockdowns. 23% blame corporations. And get this. Only 6% blame Putin, despite the nonstop narrative that, that's presented every single day in the media. Now, let's get to the war narrative. You know, we're being told that Russia is withdrawing from uh, surrounding Kiev, withdrawing from Western Ukraine, uh, and that this is because their supply lines are damaged, their morale is low, uh, their war plan is not working. Uh, this was a line from the head of GCHQ from Great Britain yesterday that they have evidence that the Russian forces have morale problems, supply problems, and so on. Well, the Russians are saying that they're accomplishing their objectives, and now they're going to focus on their next objective. They're, they're, they're accomplishing the first objective to destroy Ukraine's uh, military capabilities, and they're moving toward their second objective, which is to uh, protect the Donbass, moving into East Ukraine. Well, Alexei Arestovich, who is an advisor to Zelensky in a press conference yesterday, said Russia has almost completely destroyed Ukraine's defense industry. So that's not a Western media spin. That comes from a top advisor to President Zelensky. Now then we have something which is, is quite interesting. The Russian Ministry of Defense released further evidence of the presence of bioweapons program inside Ukraine that was done in conjunction with the U.S. And they have documents that include uh, questions sent from a Ukrainian company to the Turkish producer of drones, that is the drones from Turkey which are being uh, sold to Ukraine. They were asked if they have the capability to deliver aerosol spray payloads over 300 kilometers distance. Now, why would you be asking if the drones from Turkey can carry aerosol spray uh, 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 payloads? Well, because you're thinking of using weapons. You're thinking of using bioweapons. Now, there's further evidence coming out uh, of the Ukrainian government deciding in early February, before the Russian special military operations, to ship pathogenic materials from these labs that were stored in Ukraine by military aircraft to the United States. 
and that th those remaining pathogens which were not shipped were to be, to be destroyed in the labs by order of the Ukraine Ministry of Health. Why would they want to destroy them and remove them? To keep them from the Russians is what they would say? Or to prevent the evidence of these illegal weapons being developed in Ukraine? Which certainly would confirm Putin's warning that Russia did face real security concerns from Ukraine. Now, interestingly, there are some other documents being released by the Russians, which may portend something that will come out in the future about the involvement of the president's son, Hunter Biden, in, quote, creating financial opportunity to work with pathogens on the territory of Ukraine, unquote. Uh, they have emails which have now been confirmed or have been authenticated. Even the Washington Post admits that the emails on Hunter Biden's laptop uh, were uh, legitimate. But the, they have emails uh, between Biden and contractors Black and Veatch and Metabiota that confirm that Biden had an involvement in uh, providing financial help for these companies. So this is a story that will continue to follow. Uh, it, it's extremely important given Putin's warnings of the danger of Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian government to the Russian ethnic population and to the population of Russia itself. Uh, warnings that have been poo-pooed by the relevant US and NATO authorities. Now, finally, I want to take a look at the threats being uh, presented by the U.S. against countries that are not going along with the sanctions regime, not condemning Russia. Two in particular, Pakistan and India, stand out because both of these countries have a history of involvement with the non-aligned movement. Both of them have had prime ministers who were assassinated. In the case of Pakistan, Ali Bhutto, whose family members point the fingers at Henry Kissinger, who warned Bhutto not to develop an independent nuclear capability. Uh, and of course, in India, you have Indira and Rajiv Gandhi who were targeted by assassins. Uh, so here's the story coming out of, of uh, Pakistan. The U.S. is being accused of being behind the no-confidence no vote facing Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, in the Pakistani parliament. A senior official was quoted by the uh, ambassador to the United States from Pakistan as having said that relations between the U.S. and Pakistan will improve if Khan is no longer in office. So this, given the Bhutto case, is extremely interesting. And the Pakistani prime minister Khan has been cooperating with China and Russia in addressing the, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and has offered to mediate between the U.S. and China, but has refused to support the sanctions policy against Russia. So keep an eye on that. Now then on India, the, you have uh, Sergei Lavrov is in Delhi. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was in, in India last week. Uh, India has refused to go along with the sanctions regime and in fact has increased its trade with Russia and is talking now about a, an exchange, uh, a, a formal exchange relationship between the rupee and the ruble. Well, the U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics, Dalip Singh, was sent to Delhi to twist some arms. He's identified as one of the chief architects of the U.S. sanctions program. He told a press conference about his meetings in India. He said that he urged India not to increase energy inputs from Russia and, quote, not to create mechanisms to prop up the ruble and undermine the dollar-based financial system, unquote. This is important. The U.S. is sending diplomats to countries, warning them not to act against the dollar-based financial system. Why are they doing that? Because the dollar-based financial system is collapsing and because countries are looking for an alternative 
because the U.S. is stealing dollars from countries such as Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, and now Russia and Afghanistan, and threatening to do so to countries that don't go along with the U.S. sanctions policy. So on the one hand, you have those kinds of threats. And secondly, the fear that what, as we've said, is really one of the, the defining concerns for the U.S. is the potential for a new financial system coming from the China-Russia agreement signed on February 4th. So what Singh said in his press conference is that the discussions he had were done in the, quote, spirit of friendship, unquote, but that there would be consequences for countries that do not cooperate with the United States. Now, these are matters that I've covered today that, as I said, you're not going to hear about from the mainstream media, but they're crucial to take into consideration when you decide what can you do about this. And today I'll just leave you with this thought. Go to the SchillerInstitute.com website and sign up for our conference a week from Saturday on April 9th, where we're going to take up the question of how citizens can effectively intervene to change the policies of the Western governments, including the United States and NATO countries. As you can see from this update, the governments of these countries are not acting in your interests. They're acting in the interest of private operatives, financial speculators, corporate cartels in their attempt to maintain the power that's existed in their hands since the end of the Cold War. We have to have an alternative system, one that's based on the principles of the Peace of Westphalia, not based on might makes right. So go to the SchillerInstitute.com website and sign up for our conference, and I'll see you next week.